I'm going to switch right on to the aortic regurg, and maybe at the end we can take quick questions. So let's switch here, hopefully. And aortic regurg is a also, also a disease of the aortic valve. So it's the, however, with AI, you, you have an acute entity, acute AI, right? And it's endocarditis, 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 and once in a while, an aortic dissection, okay? So it's a disease of endocarditis 99% of the time, okay? Now, sometimes a, an acute type A will give you rapid acute AI. Traumatic, imagine, you know, you went to the wrong place, somebody put a knife in your heart, and, you know, but those are, again, not very common. So it's endocarditis, endocarditis, endocarditis. <coughs> These people are very sick. They may not have a murmur because their blood pressure is 100 over 40. And it's so much AI that they, you don't hear anything. And so they have a normal blood pressure with a white pulse pressure. That's your red light. That's where you go, oops, something is going on. And, that, and this is what happens if you put catheters. You have a very low rapid descent of your aortic runoff pressure and a rapid increase in the LV pressure. So they reach almost uh, the same pressure by the end and very little murmur. If you do an echo, you find a rapid descent of your CW velocity, mitral valve closes rapidly, there's practically no atrial flow because of the fact of what you see here. Con chronic is a whole different disease. Chronic is all the opposite. It's like a yes. It goes for years, it goes for years, it goes for years. It's not something that you're going to rapidly have to, unless somebody was never seen by a doctor and now they show up with bad AI. Etiology, same thing, congenital, a lot of arthropathy, which are hereditary. You have heard all this, and you have seen patients with these conditions. And in the acquired department, rheumatic heart practically never. I mean, bad enough to need surgery. Uh, Dilated aorta by any kind, any situation. Um, particularly, all the ones here, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, giant cell arteritis, uh, Marfan syndrome, all of those. Well, Marfan is in here in the, in the uh, congenital side. And the most common is degenerative. It's people who just over time, their valve gets degenerated. However, even though you see, an, you see a lot of AI in the echo lab every day, rarely do those AI mean anything because they're mild. So most of the time, we see a lot of mild AIs in the echo lab and next case, you, know, you don't worry about it. It goes for years and it's only when they become moderate to severe that we start thinking of doing something. They may start having symptoms and they also start having findings other than the murmur. So what can you do at the bedside to show how smart you are to your attending? Once in a while, it's nice to be able to do that, right? <laughs> so look at that. You can do all those things with a severe AI. These are all findings in somebody who really has severe AI. So white pulse pressure, of course, that's the, that's the one we all, we all get. Capillary pulsation, you click here and you see back and flow blood. Uh, water hammer is a very strong rapid upstroke in the carotid. Mid-diastolic rumble, the Austin Flint. This one means that, uh, this is actually very cool. If you put a finger in the femoral artery and you listen proximal to that, you'll hear a nice diastolic murmur. If you put it in anybody, if you put it in yourself and you kink your femoral artery and you put the stethoscope distal, you'll always hear a bruit, systolic. But if you put it proximal, you won't hear anything. If you have AI, you'll hear the return as a bruit. So you have a diastolic bruit in the femoral area if you're pinching the femoral artery proximal to the vessel. That's a cool one. And you can do that very easily at the bedside. Uh, systolic head bubbling, I haven't seen that one in, uh, I don't know, 30 plus years, 40 years. It's gone, we don't see it anymore. Uh, but what you can see, if you, have the, if you take the time, is that if you get blood pressures in the upper and lower extremities, more than 50 or so um, difference. In other words, the lower extremity is higher than the upper is, a, again, a tip-off that the AI could be severe. So those are things at the best side that can make you look smart. Uh, we echo, you know, we do a lot of things. We have qualitative signs, such as how much color we see in the proximal area and of the uh, aortic valve, and how the CW looks, how much retrograde flow we see in the descending aorta. All of these things, you will learn to integrate them in the echo lab to assess the severity. But the best way to assess it really would be with quantitation, trying to get a sense for regurgitant volumes, regurgitant fractions, and here are the numbers that you, they're all in the slides you will take home. Usually we're talking of having symptoms 
when Regatan volume is over 50, Regatan fraction is around 45 or more. So it's in this group here where usually the symptoms occur. Because it's a chronic disease, the ventricle adapts. So you will never see a chronic moderate to severe AI with a normal sized ventricle. I mean, it just extremely, would be extremely rare to have that. How do we get these quantitative numbers? Well, forget about this one. This was the first method ever, but it's full of mistakes, so we don't use it anymore. Echo Doppler, hopefully you will learn how to do that. It's tedious, there are sources of errors because you have to com compare flows in one more, two sides, like aortic and mitral, aortic pulmonic. And nowadays we're relying a lot more in cardiac MRI in giving us a lot more quantitative measurements. Acute AI, very simple treatment, surgery or, or hospice. They'll never survive with anything else. Do not put a balloon, not a good idea. Um, chronic is a different story, right? It goes for years. So rarely do we need surgery in moderates unless they are going to another, for another cardiac operation or some specific group. There's selective elderly people that now with TAVAR we may start thinking about, but it's not really that common. Severe is where, you know, we talk about needing surgeries. Uh, symptoms are very important because those who are symptomatic have a lot worse outcome than those who do not have symptoms. Therefore, a class one indication is severe AI with symptoms. Seem straightforward. If you are not sure about the symptoms, then uh, SXI testing is very helpful to bring symptoms up. Again, just like a yes, people are sedentary and they may not tell you all the story. However, if they are truly asymptomatic, then you look for LV function because you don't want to let them get down here where they have dysfunction of DLV because they have a much higher incidence of progression to symptoms and also mortality is much higher once you get into symptomatic groups. So the equation that you do with these people are you follow them, follow them, follow them, and you do surgery before LV dysfunction. So you want to, you want to basically follow them very well. And why that's important? Because there's a lot of observational data that shows that if you do have a replacement in the folks that already had a reduced EF, and what is a reduced EF for AI? Under 50, okay? So if you do a surgery in somebody that had 47.5% EF, this is what can happen for them, okay? Between 35 and 50, that's the curve, and below 35, that's even worse. And these are only a few years. So their outcomes are not as good doesn't mean that you don't offer surgery, but the outcomes are not as good if you wait that late. And a lot, many more of them, even with a good function involved, develop heart failure uh, in the years to come. So that's the reason why you want to catch them before to, they get to that point of LV dysfunction. And what's the magic number that Dr. Bono did uh, 30 plus years ago at the NIH and really has stuck? This is one of those research studies where the original publication really has been du duplicated many, many times is how big the heart is at end systolic. The end systolic volume or end systolic dimension that we do by echo. So as the end systolic dimension increases, whoops, the risk per year of development of LV dysfunction and or symptoms, you can see how they jump. And that's why somewhere around five becomes the magic number that the red light starts showing up. So what do the guidelines suggest? If you have severe AR and you're symptomatic, surgery. If you're as asymptomatic and you pass the stress test, then if the EF is below 50, surgery, class one. If you have a good EF, asymptomatic, you pass the stress test, then you go to the systolic dimension. And if you have a large systolic dimension, recommend, re AVI is recommended, although it's a class 2A. Um, if the heart is still small, close watching periodic monitoring. With moderate, okay, only if they're going for other cardiac surgery is usually when recommendations for AVR and it's a class 2A. Some caveats, because this is a chronic disease, people go to see doctors, they may change doctors, they may change echo labs, it can become messy because it's critical that these measurements are done in an accurate, reproducible way. And that's the trick here. When you see patients, that's the thing, is to have something you can really feel strongly that you can follow and, and feel comfortable with. 
LV dimensions are superior to NMO, so we do all these measurements today by LV. And of course, we sh we sh since we're doing now MRI in patients that we are not 100%, with MRI we get not only the, the gait and volumes, but you get the whole endospotic volume, mesospotic volume, and you also get dimensions because MRI can reproduce the same dimensions of the echo. So MRI is a, is a Con it's an um, imaging technique that we're using more and more in some of these chronic conditions when patients are asymptomatic and maybe in the gray zone and not being very sure. Thank you very much. Um,